I'm Dr. Susan Weiss of the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania in the Department of Microbiology. I'm also co-director of the newly founded Center for Research on Coronaviruses and Other Emerging Pathogens. And you are listening to the True Philadelphia Podcast with Matt O'Donnell. <laughs> If we as a species are at war with the coronavirus that causes COVID-19, then Dr. Susan Weiss is a soldier on the front lines. The professor of microbiology at the University of Pennsylvania has been researching coronaviruses for 40 years, long before anyone thought they could lead to a pandemic. As the world tries to contain the outbreak, Dr. Weiss has been doing her massively important research from her home in Marion Station to protect herself from getting infected. She took a break to speak to me in her kitchen about what she has learned about coronaviruses during her career and what she is learning right now in this edition of the True Philadelphia podcast. During our discussion, Dr. Weiss refers to SARS-1 and SARS-2. SARS-1 is the outbreak of a coronavirus in Asia in 2002 that was contained about a year later. The virus infecting people now is what Dr. Weiss refers to as SARS-2. Dr. Susan Weiss, right now in the True Philadelphia podcast. Dr. Susan Weiss, thank you so much for inviting me into your home. I want people to know at home that we've been very careful. I have wipes, we've been wiping microphones, we're making sure everything is super clean. This is where you're doing your work these days. How's that going? Um, it's a little bit odd. I'm sitting either in my kitchen with my laptop or upstairs with my desktop. And um, I'm on phone calls or webinar, web, web meetings all day long, pretty much all day long. I'm working harder than I really ever have for a very long time. Everyone thought that working at home would be a lot easier. Yeah, working at home is not easier when you're sort of involved in working on this, on this new virus. So, so much important work that you're doing, and we're going to talk about it. Uh, the first thing is you actually have samples in the lab that you're working at, samples not samples, samples, the actual coronavirus right. that is part of this pandemic. Right. Right. You have them. How'd you get them? Okay, so if you, if the way we got the, sam the virus uh, aliquot, we would call it, a little bit of the virus was from a company called BEI, which gets it from CDC, from Centers for Disease Control. Um, and the only way you can get this virus is that you have a high containment lab to work with. You have to have approval for that. And you have to have a CDC import permit um, that allows you to get the virus into your lab. So it's very strictly controlled. Where are the viruses? Are they in some type of highly secure box or what are they kept in? The viruses are in uh, what we call the BSL-3 facility. It's, it's a biosafety level three, which means it's locked. You can't get in very easily. Um, and it's only worked within that facility. It cannot leave the, that, that area. This would be if you were taking a look at some kind of radioactive substance. That's how high of a level this is, right? I think it's higher than that. Oh, really? I mean, it's radioactive stuff you can have in your lab. You're supposed to lock it up, but it's not in a special facility like that. And you have to work with it. You have to wear either a mask or what we call a papper, which, which gives you fresh air, filtered air. So, so you, this is a respiratory pathogen, so you have to be really careful working with it. You're in a biosafety hood, and you're wearing this protective clothing as well, double-gloved, a gown. So it's pretty high, high uh, containment. When I was booking this interview, you wanted to make sure that I understood that you're a scientist and not a clinician. And I know what that means, right. but just explain to people what the difference is to be a scientist who analyzes coronaviruses and someone who is a clinician working with coronaviruses. Okay, so I've been, I'm a basic scientist, which means I study how viruses replicate and cause disease in either tissue culture or sometimes in an animal model. So we're interested in really the, uh, the mechanisms by which viruses infect cells and how the cells respond and how the viruses respond to the cells and vice versa. There's a kind of battle going on between the virus and the cell. So we're a little bit removed usually from, from human patients. Uh, we use animal models if we want to model human human uh, infections. Uh, clinicians actually uh, take care of people uh, and do clinical studies and um, test vaccines and drugs and things like that. Scientists might develop those vaccines and drugs, but we're not generally the people that are actually um, administering the, the, the clinical trials or taking care of the people. Mm -hmm. Some people do both, by the way. Some people are called clinician scientists, and they may do like basic science as part of their job and then also take care of patients. Okay. I want to 
talk about how you've been doing this for 40 years. Yeah. And you said that at one point before the SARS epidemic mm -hmm. and SARS was a coronavirus, that was back in 2002, yes. when you were, before that happened, no one really knew what coronaviruses were about. And people used to ask you, why are you wasting your time? Well, not that quite wasting your time. That, well, but yeah. why, why are you in this field? It's, it's not interesting okay. to us. And that seems kind of ironic right now, doesn't it? Is it is very ironic now. There were always a group of people interested in these viruses. There are a lot of um, animal viruses in this group. And so that it was in, like um, chickens, cows, pigs, um, dogs, cats, all have coronaviruses mm -hmm. that can infect them. So veterinarians were very interested in these viruses for a long time. The chicken virus, I looked back, was, was described in 1930s. Um, so, so those people were interested in it. And then there was always a, was a small group of scientists interested in these viruses just because the science is interesting. We studied the mouse coronavirus for a long time. It would be called a model virus. And so um, it infects a mouse and causes hepatitis and encephalitis and demyelinating disease. So it was used for a long time by a lot of people to study virus-induced hepatitis or, um, or central nervous system disease. And we learned a lot about the virus, the basic things the virus does and how it replicates, so that when SARS did emerge and we were all shocked that it was a coronavirus, um, we knew a lot, about, a lot about these viruses. Had there not been that 20 years of research on basic coronaviruses, it would have been a lot diffi more difficult to figure out what SARS was. Why were you interested in this research to begin with? Well, scientists are just interested in, in interesting questions. Just, it was an interesting question of, um, the reason I started with this particular virus group was I was looking, I was finishing up my postdoc studies in California and I was looking for something new to work on. I wanted to go back to my roots, which was studying these types, not coronavirus, but these sort of broadly big group of RNA viruses, they would be called. And so um, I just looked through a journal and I saw some papers about this virus and it looked like it was ripe for the picking. It was just early in the study of this virus, yet you could work with it. Some viruses are hard to work with, hard to replicate, hard to work with in the lab. This one looked like you could do it. It was, it was ready, and yet there weren't a whole lot of people working on it. And scientists kind of compete with each other, so it's nice to pick out something that looks like wide open. And, it, and yeah, it provided 40 years of research for me. The mouse coronavirus was first described in 1949, so it's not that new. Okay. Um, but actually, with modern research techniques, we can explore these viruses a lot better. So, so the cold viruses were around at least described in the 60s and 70s. Two cold viruses, then, uh, and then really, the, and then all these animal viruses, and then the first human virus that was really came emerged, as they say, was was SARS, the first SARS. I call it SARS one. And then after, the, after SARS, people looked for more coronaviruses, and they found two more called NL63 and HKU1. And those viruses are more, cause more severe um, diseases than the cold, but not as bad as SARS. They cause um, pneumonia or croup. So they're kind of intermediate in virulence. And then SARS just kind of blew everything. I mean, then after, after that, so we had SARS, and we had the cold viruses, and we had these intermediate viruses. And then in 2012, we had MERS. Are you familiar mm, yep, with MERS? Absolutely. Okay, so MERS again is a coronavirus. And MERS was slightly different from SARS, but more lethal, but spread less. It's, MERS is still causing new infections, by the way. There are six or seven total coronaviruses? Well, you mean human ones. There human, are yes. two, four, seven. And there could be more. Yeah, I'm sure there are. And there could be more that haven't jumped to humans yet. There could be many more. Because... As you probably know, they, they origin, originated in bats, mm -hmm. and bats harbor, innu there are innumerable species of bats and innumerable viruses in each bat. So, yeah. And maybe I, we wondered, it could, they could have actually um, infected humans, but we wouldn't know it because it didn't cause a horrible disease. We don't really know that. Some are stronger than others or, or better at yeah, what they yeah, do yeah. as yeah. viruses. Like, some, like 2298, another cold virus, it, it probably had its origin in bats also. So it's not like every virus that comes from a bat's going to kill people. In the lab, you use mice to study. Um, we've studied we've studied the mouse virus in the mouse a lot. Um, people, why is it so Why is it so interesting to you to use mice? Well, it's an because it's like it's like a natural infection of a real uh, organism. Mm -hmm. So so like you can study a lot of stuff in tissue culture, but you don't really know what it's going to do in the whole animal because there's no real 
huge host response in a cell. And it, I mean, there is a response, an innate response, but the whole immune system and the interaction of all the different cells is much more complicated um, than just looking in a dish. I've heard this particular coronavirus being described as something that's individually easy to destroy. What does that mean? As, as alone, the virus, yeah. it, it needs something. It needs a host. All viruses. Without, yeah, and, and without that, right. they're, they're pretty much ineffective in doing anything. Right. And, and they're not really real organisms. They're either. not alive. Kind of explain that. They're not, okay, they're not really organisms. They're a bunch of nucleic, a genome, which is either DNA or RNA. Like our genes are made of DNA. Um, coronaviruses have an RNA genome. Um, and then they're just that, a bunch of proteins and some lipids, some fat around them, a membrane. So there's, they have no way of making their own energy. That's essentially why they're not alive, because they can't create their own energy. So they have to exist within a cell or, I mean, they can sit on a surface, but they won't, they won't grow there. They'll just, they can sit there till they, uh, till they're, till they um, degrade basically till they fall apart. They're like lifeless ticks in a way. <laughs> like they latch onto things and they go around. They're parasites they're... Yeah, in a way. Yeah yeah. 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 As opposed to bacteria, that bacteria, if you give them some nutrients, they can grow like mm -hmm. in liquid. Um, viruses, you put them in some liquid and they'll just, they'll just sit yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah. It's like they're taking a bath. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> Let, let me talk about SARS a little bit more. Okay. And, and again, this is a coronavirus. SARS-1 or SARS-2? Well, the one in 2002. Okay. Okay, and that would be which one? That's SARS. This one is called SARS-2. Okay, yes. Two. And just, just let me say, the reason it's called SARS-2 is its, its genetic material is very similar to SARS. Okay, so SARS-1, coronavirus, 2002, okay. 8,000 people infected, 29 countries, uh, right. 774 deaths, and then it kind of disappeared right. in 2004. And I've... Three. Okay, 2003. So you've said that you think that SARS-1 was more potentially lethal it was. than this coronavirus yeah. right now. And it seems kind of strange to say, but you have some pretty good points on why you think that. Well, the numbers, if you look at the numbers of deaths per infection, although they may not be that accurate, they're, they're what, a couple percent? It really varies, but up to a few percent, right? SARS killed 10% of the people it infected. And that's kind of what's tricky about it because people got so sick with SARS that they were isolated, treated in the hospital. Um, hospital personnel were infected, close family were infected, but it wasn't like, like this virus. There are people walking around on the street that, that have asymptomatic or weak or very mild symptoms and they're still contagious. So that's what makes this virus in a sense is less lethal, but more contagious. So more, more, more spreading, spreading faster. So SARS really, you said 29 countries, but the vast majority of it was in Asia. And there was a, an outbreak in Toronto, but mostly it was in Asia. So I think that it, it never became worldwide in the sense that this one has. So in terms of how it spread, you also noted that this coronavirus, SARS-2, kind of got lucky because it was in a massively populated yes. area, Wuhan, right. and also around New Year's Day, Right. Or Chinese New Year, which is when a lot of people travel. Right. And SARS didn't have that, uh, those things going yes. on to help it spread. Probably. As quickly, right? I mean, SARS started in, in Guangdong province yeah. in the south of China. I'm not sure. It's probably pretty densely populated, but I'm not sure. Apparently, Wuhan, that people compared to Detroit, is a big yes. manufacturing area, and a lot of people. I've are been close to together. Wuhan. Oh, you have? They call okay. it the Chicago of okay. China, actually, because it's kind of in the Midwest, in the middle, and it's it's um, a nexus of. of air flights and train flights. We took a train actually from Shanghai to Wuhan. It was an amazing city. It does seem like kind of like Chicago. Um, and there were a lot of people there. And as you said, they were moving around a lot because of New Year's. Mm -hmm. And the other problem that, the other issue that made it so bad was that there was about, I think a month of infections before the, the sort of official government would um, own up to it, would admit it. Because they didn't want people to panic from what I understand. SARS-1, again, this is in yeah. 2002, spiked over eight months and then kind of disappeared. disappeared. Yeah. Does anyone know why it did? I think, it, well, I think that the disease disappeared because, again, because the sick people were taken care of, they either died or got better and they were in hospitals. They weren't like walking on the streets. So there was no, there weren't many people walking around with it. I don't did, think didn't so. didn't have many symptoms. Yeah. You either had it and you right. were really sick or right. you didn't. Right, right. So in a way, it was a, like a more lethal virus that spread less. It also, in, I think, inherently spreads to, spread less readily than this virus. Um, I don't understand completely. It did disappear. There were a couple of laboratory uh, accidents after that where people got infected in China. Right. 
while that we're was analyzing it. things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, again, no one really seems to understand why it went away. And it could have been temperature outside. It could have been the mm-hmm. fact that, you know, it was so in, apparent as to whether you're infected I, I or not. I think it's more it that. It's easy to pick people out. If you think I think it's more reason. public health. I mean, it, went, it did go away. And it was in the summer when it disappeared. So I don't know how much the weather had to do with it. It was July, pretty much. Because we, we went to China that following September. It started like around January, and then it ended around July, and then by September, when we were there, it was safe. There's no was well, we didn't know about any danger. Explain yeah. how a coronavirus jumps from an animal to a human. Okay, so um, they they come from bats, uh, and they're it's can actually, they come from other animals? Well, or they're, mainly they're, bats. Mo- mainly they're, they're the most ancestral ones would be from bats. Okay. I think it's fair to say. Okay. Um, and they and um, it's an enteric disease in bats, so they excrete it. It would be in, in their, their guano, guano. yes. Yeah. Um, maybe in urine, I'm not sure, but in their guano. And, Which is um, why people tell you to stay away from, from that bad stuff. guano. Yeah, even around here. Because <laughs> you know there are many, many viruses in bats, mm-hmm. uh, and dangerous ones like Ebola and those kind of viruses come from bats as well. Um, I don't think there are any dangerous. Well, people have looked in this country and haven't found any SARS-like viruses, to what from what I understand. But anyway. So the guano is, could, could be um, contacted by other animals, like SARS, the intermediate animal is a civet. So these are like civet cats, they call them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I finally saw one a couple of years ago. But anyway, so, so the, the civet could get it from the, uh, the bat. And, 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 um, and then it, the civet, some, a, a person could be in contact with the civet in the marketplace and touch it or, I don't know, had to get some kind of fluid some kind from of, the cat, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like an eye drop, yeah. Uh, moisture from right. the mouth, and then there's also the eating of animals, which is something that happens yeah, in China. Because if they're cooked, it's, yeah, if you're handling them, yes. Okay. If you're cooking them, it's the virus is gone, and all of these things do involve a little bit of some genetic changes in the in the virus. So viruses change all the time, slowly from host to host. Right. right? So you have to adapt to the new host, and and so <clears throat> it's not believed that SARS ever actually really lived in civets, it, it's like a rare event to go to the civet and to the human. But MERS is really interesting. MERS, um, the intermediate uh, animal is a camel. So it turns out that camels in Africa and Asia are, have lots and lots of camels have, have MERS infections, but they're not really sick. They can get like a drippy nose. And so that camel herders or camel workers are the people that mostly caught uh, MERS. So it's different, like this, the, the SARS went from bat to civet to human, but it's not like endemic in civets, whereas MERS went from bat to camel, where it kind of hangs out and then can, can slowly infect humans. So there's still people still getting MERS infections in the Middle East. At one point, they thought that mm. this coronavirus that causes COVID-19 went from the bat to a pangolin, which yeah. if people don't know, it's a scaly anteater right. that it lives in China. Yeah. And people pretty much are saying that's probably not the case anymore. Is that correct? I, I, think, I think we don't know. The, the reason that they think that the pangolin was the, was the intermediate um, species was that people isolated pangolin uh, co- se- sequences that look, coronavirus sequences from pangolins that look very close in sequence to the SARS-2. So the SARS-2 is most closely related to a bat virus called RTG-13, doesn't really matter, but- Right off the top of your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I'm talking about this every day. Yeah, yeah. True scientist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so so um, the pang- the virus in the pangolin had some features that look very similar to the, to the SARS-CoV-2, but not as similar as the bat virus. Um, so some people think it could have been a recomb- recombinant virus. So sometimes viruses can, you get two viruses into a cell and they can it's exchange genetic material, so to speak. So you get a new virus out. And they, and they adapt more rapidly with two Perhaps. together. Right? Well, it depends what, yeah, it, that, that could be a, a case, the case. I mean, flu viruses reassort, they do that sort of thing too. Okay. But anyway, so I, I think my opinion is that I don't think that it's at all proven that the pangolin is the host of, was the host of the virus. And, and I should point out, too, a lot of times these pangolin and bat viruses aren't actually isolated as infectious viruses. They're just like the guano is sequenced, and you can see that there were sequences representing viruses. They're oftentimes not isolated. This is getting into the next question I okay. want to talk to you about. This is one of your studies, that which, you, your, which one, one of your papers. Uh, it was back in 
2020, yeah, February. And oh. it, the paper details why this was not created in a lab. This oh, latest coronavirus. oh, I was only an extra on this paper. Yes. Yeah. But I think it's interesting okay. that anyone even had to study this to try and disprove such a conspiracy theory. Well, I mean, it doesn't look like anything that anyone's ever created in the lab. That's one thing. I mean, like the sequences are across, say, the, the, the genome we call the genetic material. They're, they're similar to SARS, but they're different all along. So, so and, and no one could even really imagine how to make such a successful virus. I don't know how you could ever design it's it. It's beyond human it's, understanding. I think so. We don't understand why this virus behaves the way it does. It looks like SARS, but it's not quite SARS. And the other thing is, I would have thought if it came from a lab that maybe someone would have gotten sick in the lab. <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> why would someone create something that wasn't really effective in killing people, too? Well, it's pretty effective. But it's disrupted in, the whole world. Yes, in disruption yeah. level, yeah. yes. So that would be even more diabolical if you could disrupt the world, even Absolutely. if you didn't kill quite as many. And actually killing a lot more people than ever killed SARS. If you look at the total number, percentage is down, but the total number is way up much higher. So can we talk about some of the things that happen to humans with this coronavirus and what you think? And I know yeah. this is beyond yeah, yeah. your research, okay. but I mean, what are some of the things that you're looking at and, and what are the things that are kind of ringing bells? Okay, I'll tell you a little bit about it that I know. This is very general. Um, so it infects the respiratory tract. It seems to infect the nose and down into the lungs, deep into the lungs, and that's why it's so dangerous. Um, there's been a report I've just read about, maybe you have too, about people losing their sense of yes. smell. Um, I was talking to some ENT people and nobody really understands why, but it's pretty interesting. And they wonder, will they get their sense of smell back? I don't and know. And some people apparently do. They do? Okay. I but, yeah. and so does that tell you anything right there? The Not sense to me. Of smell? Not to me. I don't know much about sensory, you know, smell sensors in the nose. Um, but it infects, uh, it uses this receptor called ACE2 that's found deep in the lung. It's found also in the heart and other kidneys, I think. Um, and it's so many viruses and coronaviruses, they, they cause disease not only by infecting the cells and killing the cells, but by inducing what's called a cytokine storm. You've probably heard that expression. Basically, it's like... If um, I said yes, I'd be lying. Okay. <laughs> a cytokine storm is just like an immune part of the immune response. Cytokines are mediators that do all sorts of things um, in response to infections, and they can do destructive things. They cause massive inflammation, and that's not always so good sure. um, for the cells. So, so basically, the, the disease is... Probably, well, not only, I pretty much caused by both the combination of the virus itself and also the, um, the host immune response to the virus. And what does it tell you that is able to attack you in the upper and the lower respiratory areas? Just that, just that receptors for the virus. Re viruses always um, attach to a, a protein on the cell surface called a receptor. And uh, part of what we call the tropism, that's like where the virus goes, what organ it goes to, has to do with how well the receptor is expressed in these different um, parts of the body. But it's not the only thing because once the virus gets in, um, some cells are going to be more receptive to others than others to, to replication of the virus. So it's a combination of virus getting into the cell and then what happens afterwards. And back to the immune response, yeah. that's what I find super interesting because sometimes things that hurt you kind of make you hurt yourself. Yes. And so, that may be what's happening with this. Right. So immune responses can be, I mean, they are protective also. So it's a combination of part of the immune response is protects you against the virus, like a vaccine. When you get a vaccine, that induces an immune response, and that's pr generally protective, mm -hmm. although you have to be sure that's protective and not pathogenic as well. Um, so that's why vaccines have to be tested for, for other effects, sure. right? Um, but at the same time, uh, the cytokine storm can be destructive. The SARS-2 yeah. virus samples you have at Penn in the lab what are you hoping to learn very soon and down the road as you do very your soon well very soon i'll tell you what we're doing right now is just supporting the trying to help the clinicians figure out how much virus is in samples and things like that uh, we want to know um we we want to know how to destroy it like how is how safe or dangerous dangerous it is on um in, in samples we want to know how much is there so that that's sort of um 
just a support function, but for our own lab, we want to we want to know how it compares to other coronaviruses we've worked with in terms of how it interacts with cells and the immune response. That's my particular um, interest in the innate immune response. We want to know some of the. If you look at the genome of SARS two and and the original SARS, there are some subtle differences, um, and I think that's important to understand if those differences have uh, can be reflected in how it interacts with cells. When you say destroy it, do you mean trying to find something that will destroy it in a human body, in a human host? Well, okay, so as a big picture, this center that, we're, that I'm part of, co-director of now, is trying to bring together all kinds of people from, Penn has an enormous uh, health system, and so people are really coming from everywhere wanting to work on vaccines, on antivirals. Sarah Cherry, my colleague, is in the BSL-3 right now, probably um, doing anti, testing antiviral compounds. Um, so yeah, so there's a huge force at Penn uh, trying to deal with this virus in a lot of different ways. It's almost like this is another Manhattan Project going on. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I mean, it, it's pretty how, big. How important is it for us to one day have a universal viral vaccine? Well, it won't be a universal viral vaccine, but it could be a universal coronavirus vaccine. Well, I don't know about a vaccine. There could be. Vaccines are going to take time, and generally they're directed against a particular protein and a particular virus, so they're probably going to be more specific to each virus. But, but antiviral drugs, like they're repurposing now this um, Ebola drug, for uh, it's being tested for this virus because it inhibits what we call the RNA polymerase, and this is an enzyme that viruses use to replicate their own RNA. So, so even though they're parasites, um, they replicate in the cytoplasm of cells so that they have to bring along their own mechanisms for replicating. Uh, even though they can't make their own energy, they can have their own enzymes. So um, many viruses have their, these so-called polymerases, or replicases, have a similar structure. So that's why you can imagine that a drug that might work against Ebola might work against sure. uh, coronavirus. And the really nice thing would be there are many conser what we call conserved proteins among all the coronaviruses. That means they're really similar. So that if you can get a drug that works against one of these proteins, it may be like a, we call, would call a pan-coronavirus drug. So, cause, because we want to be prepared for future coronaviruses as well. Which and there will be more. Probably. I mean, it seems to be, so far, they've been like almost 10 years apart, the bad ones anywhere. Anyway. Does that mean anything I don't you? think so. It's just no. coincidence? I think so. I think so. so. I know the causation correlation is pretty big in the science community, right? Yeah, but <laughs> there's, no, I mean, they leak out of the bats. At, sure. And like I said, there may have been intermediate ones that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you're, there's an enormous amount of pressure on you to quicken your research for the good of everyone, given that this a is bit, happening right now? A bit. I feel like, so my whole lab is my, the four people. Penn is not allowing people to work unless you work on essential work, and this is considered essential. So I, four people in my lab are up there working away to try to uh, help both, both help get things set up for the, for the clinical samples and also to start actually, um, I, we had I, so many people have come to me wanting to offer us like um, specialized cells that we like nasal epithelial cells or things like that to see how the virus grows in them, which would be really exciting. So that's fun. That's good. So you do feel a lot of pressure. I mean, yes. Just like, but you can only go at a certain amount of pace because the science has to be right. Right. But you can go at the pace of having like conferences all day long and all night long. <laughs> um, can I talk to you about how we as a, the world community has responded to this? Okay. Do you have any thoughts on, I mean, at first, everyone seemed to blow this off and say, oh, well, the flu is much Our president worse. blew it off. Yes. So, I mean, tell me your thoughts on, on not just this country, but how other okay, countries have so, dealt with this. So there's been a real um, variety of responses. Um, I just heard today, that, I read today in the Times that, that there are more infections here than there were in China, yeah, which sort of blew correct. me away because the idea was we thought that China was a disaster, So we're, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of people there. Sure. So we haven't responded very well, perhaps, because we knew it was coming. Um, from what I understand, Singapore, for example, which is a, a very wealthy company, had a hospital ready to take care of patients because after SARS, because they were hit by SARS. We weren't hit by SARS, so I think we were too casual about coronaviruses, and we, didn't, we weren't prepared. Have you thought about how this is going to change you, not as a scientist, but sort of your daily life? Well, I'm wondering whether we're going to, is this going to become our daily, I mean, it's going to be like this for a while. I have no idea how long. 
But I've read speculation that after all this, maybe we're going to work at home more and maybe we're going to, um, yeah, which I, I have very mixed feelings about that. I, I don't know whether life's going to go back to normal or whether it's going to be a real change. Is the real difference maker whether or not this jumps to the next season? I, not, not to me. I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, if it, if it jumps to next season, eventually people are going to get hurt, what they call herd immunity. You've probably heard of that, where, sure. no pun intended, where you, um, when enough people get infected, it'll sort of become part of the, um, just part of the population. You're doing great work. We appreciate it. I appreciate your time because apparently you have a conference call coming up very shortly. No, actually, you... just not a conference call, but yeah. You have other stuff have a, to yeah. do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Including, including a, um, a Zoom meeting with my, my extended family yeah, today. You're, you're almost like uh, part of the first responders when a fire mm. breaks out, but this is much Except I'm thing. sitting at home. Yeah, but you're still doing... Right. I'm not exposing myself because I'm over 65. Please be careful. Yeah. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Dr. Susan Weiss from University of Pennsylvania on the True Philadelphia podcast. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Matt. And just like that, Dr. Weiss took a look at her email inbox and it was loaded again. Back to work. Our thanks to Dr. Weiss and all of the medical professionals out there who are trying to care for us, protect us, and treat us all while trying to find a way to prevent this pandemic from happening again. I'm Matt O'Donnell, and this is the True Philadelphia Podcast.